Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Growing Manchester Introduction to Beekeeping webinar. Um, run, we run largely today by guest speaker Paul. I'm Emily from a social enterprise in Manchester called So The City. The webinar is part of a programme we run called Growing Manchester, which is funded by the NHS to improve access to sustainable food in Manchester and increase the health and well-being of the wider community. We've been running webinars for a few weeks now since all this kind of lockdown situation um, on all sorts of different subjects. And you can find recordings of these on our Vimeo page. And so this week's webinar is all about beekeeping um, and just link linking to our Growing Manchester projects. So uh, this week's webinar is all about part beekeeping of the program, um, with, and just um, linking beehives on Growing site. Manchester projects. So, so in South Manchester, we have a part of the program, uh, Riverbank with, Community Garden um, and Charlton beehives on site, where there are so, uh, a few hives, and they're managed by an organisation called Bee Educated, and we will link to their website at the end. The presentation they offer courses and um, experience in beekeeping and things like that. And then if you're in North Manchester, there's St. Dunstan's Community Allotment site in Blakely, and they also have a few hives. Um, so bees are really important, uh, of course, I'm sure as you'll know, in, in the pollination of fruits and vegetables. More than 80% of our crops, uh, of crops grown for human consumption, fruits, vegetables, nuts, sunflowers and rapeseed, coffee, tea, cocoa, they need bees and other insects to pollinate them to increase yields and quality. In the UK, insect pollinators are worth, well, I've seen different figures, but uh, £7 billion uh, pounds a year in terms of the value of crops that they pollinate. So bees are generally the most effective pollinators as they visit loads more flowers and carry more pollen between them. They're a really positive addition to a community allotment site and a great source of income for groups selling honey and things. And they also attract um, a new group of people, um, of volunteers to a site. So I'm going to hand over to Paul now, uh, who will talk you through a bit of the theory around beekeeping, as well as practical advice on how to get you started. Thanks, Emily. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Um, so as Emily mentioned, I'm Paul CB, and I'm just going to run through a presentation today on my experiences with beekeeping. I started beekeeping about 10 years ago and it was actually on the back of a Manchester City Council initiative to get more allotments, um, to get bees on allotments. So Manchester City Council funded a course which was a two-day thing which I attended along with um, some of the other uh, plot holders from all around Manchester and we learned a bit about the theory of beekeeping and as a follow-up to then, we, we then got some bees and it was um, really my first experience of beekeeping. I, I, apart from the course, I didn't know a lot, uh, but I certainly learned a lot uh, over the years. So after um, managing bees on uh, an allotment site in Manchester for a couple of years, I then um, got some bees of my own and I've, I've been beekeeping ever since. So in terms of what we'll cover today, I'll talk a little bit about honeybees. What are honeybees? Um, talk about where bees live, their hives, talk about where, uh, what you need to, to place a hive, what's a good location. Uh, we'll talk then a lot about the, you know, the various roles of honeybees in a hive. So I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of the worker bee and the queen bee and their other types of bee as well. And I'll just talk a little bit about, about their bi biology and what they do, and also about the life cycle of a bee. And then we'll talk a bit about the practical aspects of beekeeping, swarming, which I'm sure uh, most of you will have heard of. And, you know, finally talk about the bee products. So honey, wax and other, and other things. Um, as I say, this presentation will be roughly half an hour with time for questions at the end. So first and foremost, um, I know there's a, a, a variety of experience of beekeeping uh, amongst us, but I'd just like you to take uh, a minute to just look at this picture and identify which is the honeybee. So I'll just give you a chance to have a think about that. Okay, um, well, the answer, the correct answer I'll just zoom into is this one. Uh, sometimes people, um, 
don't always correctly identify a honeybee. Um, they think honeybees um, are actually wasps, and they do. I guess they are wasp shaped in in some ways. I'll just zoom into the wasp. The wasp is um, this one on the bottom right. Well, it's one species of wasp. There are um, different species of honeybee in the world. There are different lots and lots of species of bee, and lots and lots of species of wasp as well. The one that I'm going to talk about today is the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. Um, and certainly in this part of the world, it's the one which people use for commercial beekeeping. And it's one that you know we have a long history as humans with. Um, we've been keeping bees for thousands of years, um, sort of managing them for their honey and other products such as wax. I mean, wax was very obviously very important, especially back in the day when it was used for candles, for, for lighting, etc. Um, but often people get confused with, you know, what a honeybee is. A honeybee does have this kind of um, wasp-like shape, but it's quite different in color, certainly to, to this species of wasp anyway. And they tend to be a little bit furrier than a wasp. Wasp tend to be more, much, much harsher looking in terms of their, their, um, um, <clears throat> their, you know, their, their color. Um, but they are sort of similar size. So the other um, insects on this picture in the top left hand corner is a bumblebee or one species of bumblebee. And that's sometimes what people get confused with. So bumblebees are like honeybees. They, they do collect nectar and pollen. They do live in colonies of multiple individuals, uh, but tend to be much, much smaller numbers. So we're talking dozens of bees rather than honeybee colonies, which tend to be about 20,000 individuals. Um, and, and then the other insects in the picture, the two in the middle are actually hoverflies, but they, they look a little, little bit like wasps or bees, and that's part of their mimicry, probably to deter predators from, from uh, catching them and, and eating them. Maybe they've had a bad experience with a wasp before and they think the yellow and black is a danger color. So certain inse insects like hoverflies can mimic bees, uh, but again, they're important pollinators and um, they also eat uh, other insects. And then in the very bottom left is uh, another species of bee. It's a solitary, solitary bee, a mason bee. Um, and again, these are just just one of a number of of um, uh, you know species of of bee and wasp out there. But just yeah, just to reiterate, the the honey bee is the the top right hand picture. So where do bees live? Um, you've got a picture of various uh, nests on on this uh, slide. Now the, the honeybees, um, I'll just zoom in so everyone's clear, is the top left. Now, and usually what I'd say is that this colony has obviously set up in somebody's uh, window frame. And you wouldn't normally see this in, in this country, you know, certainly uh, in continental Europe where it's a lot warmer, you know, this might be more common, but more often than not, Honeybees will live in a cavity somewhere, whether it's a, a rotten tree, um, naturally in the wild, or in somebody's roof space, um, or somewhere that where they have where they can limit the um, they can sort of manage the the bees going in and out, as in they can kind of deter predators, uh, wasps, other other insects which might be trying to eat eat the bees, or you know other animals which might be trying to to raid it for their honey. But you can see in this situation, the bees have created a, a colony in a, in a window frame and they've, they've made this white stuff, which is the wax. Now wax is very important because without the wax, you know, they don't have anywhere to store their food, to, to raise their young. And they actually make the wax um, on their bodies and then they secrete the wax and then they form it into these um, sort of paddle-like shapes. And each, um, each comb, each piece of wax has hundreds of cells in it, and each of those cells is a specific size, about the size of a bee. So they can go into the cell, they can rear an egg in the cell, or they can uh, store their honey in, in a cell. And this wax, as I mentioned previously, is obviously very important for humans as well in terms of our development and what we've used it for in, in, the, his, in the past. And it's one of, the, one of the important bee products, which we'll talk about later. But usually this, this you know, this, comb that would be within inside a tree or within a hive. Um, top right picture, just for comparison, is a 
zoom in, is a wasp's nest. So here you can see it's similar little hexagon structures, which they will rear their young in and store food in. And you can see those white cells are the um, probably the, the brood that's, that's going to emerge. And you can see this has been opened up. So I'm sure we've all seen um, sort of this sort of structure hanging in a shed or in a covered area somewhere or in a tree possibly. Uh, so this is a wasp's nest and it's actually made out of paper. So the wasps will go and chew some bark or something like that. And then they'll gradually build up the um, the nest with um, by, by making paper mache basically. Um, and then on the bottom left, just, just to zoom in again, uh, for comparison, this is a bumblebee's nest. So you can see, um, similar to the honeybees, you have these kind of uh, structures, little, uh, little egg-like things. Those are um, the cells where they raise their young. And also that glistening stuff you can see in some of the cells, that is the honey. So bumblebees do make honey. They collect nectar and they store, um, store it as honey. Um, and then they, they raise their, their young in similar in a similar way. And if you've ever seen a bumblebee's nest, often these are underground or in a, an old nest box or something like that. But, um, you know, the difference between that and a, a honeybee, honeybees really is the number of bees. Honeybees tend to have large, much, very large colonies of, as I said, up to about 20,000 or more individuals, whereas bumblebees and other, other similar bees, um, you know, you're talking dozens or maybe hundreds. And then in the bottom right hand corner for for uh, just for illustration, I mean, this is um, often what people um, buy off the shelf. This is um, a sort of known as a bug hotel or um, something for design for, you know, insects. And it's it's probably more focused on the, the solitary bee that I showed you previously in one of the slides, a little mason bee. Um, so designed for for them really to to um, maybe to rear some young or um, as, such as. So it's it's not necessarily designed for bumblebees or for honeybees or anything like that. It's obviously much too small of a structure, but again, it's, you know, designed as a space for those sort of solitary bees and lace wings and other things to live. So let's talk about um, beehives. Um, here's some examples of, uh, types of beehive. The one on the top left, I think most people will, would associate with a classical shape of a beehive. It's got uh, various boxes stacked on top of each other with a roof uh, and an entrance at the bottom. Um, and this, I think, you know, a lot of people would, would recognize as, as a beehive. Whereas for comparison, um, what I'm more used to in, in, in my beekeeping experience are these kind of more sort of square boxes. So these are sort of standard <clears throat> uh, national type um, beehives. Um, you can see they're all kind of placed together. They've got a little board at the front for the bees to land on and, and walk into the hive in an entrance way. Uh, and these are basically made up of um, a series of, of boxes which you can take apart and inspect your bees. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as in the presentation. Whereas if we look at the two pictures on the right, this was um, an older style um, place for, for bees and it's called a skep, S-K-E-P. And traditionally this was the way that beekeepers would have kept bees. So it's a woven um, wicker or woven sort of uh, with reed or something like that basket with um, basically no bottom um, with a little entrance way at the at the bottom for the bees to get in and you can see the one at the bottom right has been turned upside down and that's you know basically what it looks like you've got the comb inside which the bees have made um, and it will be you know waterproof to a certain extent uh, and uh, yeah obviously the disadvantage with this type of older style uh, beehive is that you've got no way of um, Aside from turning it upside down and have a look, you can't actually see inside and inspect the comb to see what the bees are doing. And really an important part of beekeeping is being able to understand, you know, your bees, what, what, what's happening in the hives so that you can actively manage them to try and um, manage some of the natural instincts and obviously to, to maintain them in a healthy way. So in terms of, um, I'm, I mean, I'm going to focus in, there are lots of, lots of different types of beehive. I think somebody mentioned they had a, a bar top hive. I'm going to focus primarily on, on my experience of um, hives, which is, is this kind of standard box style hive called a national. Um, 
and inside it you've got a series of frames and each frame is basically a piece of wood uh, with four sides and then there's um, the bees build their wax on that frame and each frame then you can lift out independently and inspect what your bees are doing and then you can multi multiple you can have multiple boxes in one hive um, usually you have one box for for the, the you know the queen to lay her eggs to rear new bees and then above that often you'll have um, smaller boxes for for honey for, for where the bees will store their honey um, and if you look at the top right screen this is the sort of standard national uh, brood frame so it's quite a large frame um, and as you can see the, the you know the bees are bees are sort of hanging on it which is what they do when you lift them out of the box they'll kind of generally mill around and do what they're doing um, and if you look at the bottom right I'll just zoom in so we're clear so uh, on this hive you can see this large central portion and you have this sort of creamy color that those are all um, all of the cells have basically young developing bees inside and what happens in a certain point in their life cycle is that um, well first of all the eggs are laid by the queen the eggs then develop into a grub uh, you know a sort of larval stage of the insect that which are then fed by the the worker bees and then after about two weeks the the worker bees cap the cell and the the bee undergoes a process of metamorphosis where it uh, changes into an adult bee and then it emerges as a as an adult bee so on this cell the large portion of, on this frame sorry on the large portion of in the center all of those are new bees waiting to emerge so they're probably laid as eggs a couple of weeks ago and uh, you know they're about to, to emerge and then around the outside you have this whiter looking substance that is actually the stores of honey and often you'll find on a, uh, a frame you know filled with with uh, young bees you'll have some stores of honey around the edges but primarily what a beekeeper does is it tries to keep the the, the frames with the the eggs and the brood on them and the, the young bees separate from the from the honey so he can then or she can then take the the honey off at the end of the year or take a certain percentage of it off now for comparison um, on the bottom left hand screen uh, on the left of the screen this is a much smaller frame and this is called a super frame or a honey frame and it's designed to be smaller um, so it's more manageable uh, but you can see on this frame you've also got some brood that's uh, young bees uh, and and the uh, quite a bit more honey around the edges and the main reason for having the different sizes is well um, queen bees need quite a lot of space um, to lay eggs they can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day so you want to have quite a big box with lots of space for the queen to lay in and then the smaller frames are for the honey because it's much more manageable for, for in terms of weight if you had um, you know a, a box with large frames full of honey it would probably weigh about 20 kilos so it'd be <laughs> probably do your back in trying to lift it so you have these it's certainly within the national type of hives you have the smaller frames for honey production and then the larger frames for, for rearing brood what happens if you don't put any frames in a box well this is a uh, this is what happens sometimes you, you sort of uh, put a box on top of your you know existing frame box and then of course the bees just you know decide to build their own comb so you can see in this situation similar to that skep you know their natural instinct is to, to work either build comb from the bottom up or from the top down and and they'll they'll, they'll build it out uh, in all directions as you can see in this instance and you're, you end up with a, a bit of a nightmare really where it's obviously impossible to to kind of manage them and to to to, to, to um to um you know obviously to work the bees so in terms of citing a hive um some important factors to consider um in the uk the, um, you know primarily focused on on you know this part of the world and um, some sun is good especially early sun in the morning uh, to get the bees warmed up bees generally only fly when it's uh, you know above above a certain temperature around 10 degrees um, although in the height of summer you know they, they it's good to have some shade as well because if you get very hot period then the bees have to spend a lot of time cooling down the hive by fanning their wings 
So some shade is, is obviously beneficial. Um, you can keep bees in urban and rural areas. In fact, urban bees tend to do really well, and that's primarily really down to um, the abundance of flowers that are available. Uh, certainly in, in around Manchester, you think of you know all the exotic plants that people have planted from all around the world, and rarely is there a you know a month during the year where there isn't something in in bloom. Um, that said, you know bees obviously mainly are active during the spring, summer, autumn months. When it's too cold, they don't tend to fly outside the hide, hive, or if it's very wet. I mean, bees do fly when it rains, contrary to, um, to, to some cartoons, but um, they tend to be le much less active. Um, and during the winter time, they don't hibernate as such. A lot of people think that, as in most insects, they go completely dormant and they don't do anything. Bees actually, honeybees remain active throughout the winter period, but they'll stay within in the hive. And that's why it's very important that um, if you're a beekeeper, you leave your bees with a certain amount of honey because during the winter months, they'll consume that honey and they will huddle together in a ball and they'll maintain their in, you know, in the temperature with inside the hive at, you know, plus um, sort of 17 degrees or so. When you consider it could be down to minus 10 or so outside, you know, that's quite a big, it takes a lot of energy and bees basically consume honey. They use their wing muscles to generate heat. Um, and then, you know, that's how they, that's how they survive the winter. So they, 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 they're completely, you know, active during those periods. So it's obviously important then to, to make sure that, you know, they've got enough honey to survive the winter. Um, access to water doesn't tend to be a problem in wet Manchester, but certainly um, bees aren't that fussy about the source of water. They, they often like a little pool or um, um, some wet compost or soil, and they'll take some of the water to help in producing the honey. Um, source of nectar and pollen, as I mentioned, Bees collect nectar from flowering plants, and they also collect pollen. And these are both um, in, both foodstuffs. Primarily, you know, the main is is they collect nectar, which they then process into honey. But they also eat um, pollen, and pollen is obviously produced by flowering plants as a um, to encourage insects to transfer pollen from one um, uh, flower to another, or from one plant to another. But bees will actually collect this pollen and little pollen sacks on their on their legs, and then they'll store it inside the hive, and they'll they'll feed this to to young bees um, as a source of protein. Um, other things to avoid: windy locations, tops of hills, things like that. Um, obviously, you don't want to put them, you know, next to a river where they might get flooded, or um, things like horses, livestock can potentially um, knock beehives over and. and and cause problem. Vandalism can, can be a problem, especially in um, uh, urban areas. And think about your neighbours as well. You know, if you have a beehive right next to the, to the fence, um, you know, the, there could be 20,000 bees in each of your colonies during the summer months. And so, you know, there certainly can be quite a lot of activity and, and it's not uncommon for bees to, to, to you know, to get a little bit uh, tetchy during certain times of the year and maybe be a bit more defensive and they might sort of, um, not necessarily attack, but certainly give give you any sort of uh, people who are making a lot of noise, cutting their hedges and things, a bit of a warning shot. Um, so it's me to think about those sort of acts, aspects as well. Pests, I know that um, in some parts or some places like woodpeckers can be a problem. Squirrels can break into hives. I've heard of uh, badgers, but certainly not in in urban areas, I don't think it's a bit of a problem. Uh, but I've had, I found the odd mouse in a hive, you know, just mainly wanting to overwinter, but certainly um, causing a bit of a problem. Um, and then access, you know, making sure you've got an, um, some point of access to, to, to be able to get in and out to manage your hives. Um, you might want to think about if, you've, if you're putting them in a sort of on grass, you know, the grass is going to grow, are you going to be able to cut the grass? Strimming around a hive, you know, is, is, is probably a big no-no. Well, you probably want to avoid it certain times of the year because of um, you know the, the noise and vibration that might might sort of aggravate the bees, and then just just having enough real space to to get in and open up the hives. So just for uh, an example, this is my setup at home. I planted the hedge um, behind the hives, and I and I and I grew the hedge up um, in front of the hives. And you can see it's quite a small space, but I managed to squeeze in a couple of hives. 
And, um, you know, it's got, not quite well hidden. I mean, most people aren't aware that there are actually bees in there. And the advantage of having something tall in front of the hives is that it forces the bees to fly up and out of people's eye line because, um, you know, given, given the chance, they just, you know, obviously fly lower and uh, potentially fly past, you know, fly at people's head height. So in this way, it's kind of forcing them up and into the air quite quickly, which uh, means that, you know, they're not really causing a problem to anyone. So moving on to the types of bee in a hive, I mentioned earlier about worker bees um, and mentioned the queen bee. So just again, a little um, task, if you could look at this picture. Top left, um, can you see the queen bee? Well, luckily it's only, only a few dozen bees, but yes, the one in the middle, uh, who's slightly longer than the other bees and a slightly different colour as well. She is the queen bee and she's always um, larger than the, the worker bees, but can vary in size from much, much larger to, to just slightly longer. Um, so she's got a similar shaped upper part of her body with you know, a pair of wings, but then a much longer abdomen. And this is where she stores all of her eggs and, and, and lays uh, to lay bees, as I mentioned, um, a queen can lay up to 2,000 eggs in a day. Um, and then at the top right, we have another example of a queen bee. In this case, you can see she's got a number, number 58. <laughs> That's obviously uh, the work of a beekeeper. So some beekeepers will mark their queens to identify them. Uh, they'll often do this so they can easily find them if they need to. They'll also identify them, uh, especially if you're managing a lot of colonies, you need to know what year um, or what, what strain potentially she is. Um, because as I mentioned, you know, we've been managing bees for, for thousands of years and um, a lot of people have, um, uh, you know, kept bees and, and bred bees and, and sort of, you know, for their characteristics, uh, for their docile nature, etc. So there's a lot of work that goes on to uh, to managing managing bees in this way. Um, and then for comparison, on the bottom left hand picture, I'll just zoom in. Um, this is a male drone bee. So there's three types of bee in a in a colony, and I'll just um, zoom over to them. Uh, as I mentioned, the worker bee. That's most of the individuals in a um, in a colony are worker bees. Um, they are non-reproductive -re female bees in, in essence, and they do everything in the hive. Um, as soon as they emerge as adult bees, they then take on the duties of cleaning and feeding, processing honey. And then once they become flying worker bees, then the, obviously their main tasks are to gather nectar and pollen. Um, and also to defend the hive. As I mentioned previously, the, the queen bee, her only real role really is to lay eggs. Um, she doesn't even feed herself, so she gets fed by the workers. Um, so, so, but she's obviously one of the most important uh, individuals in the hive because she's the only reproductive um, capable of, of laying, you know, uh, eggs. Um, and then we have drone bees, which are the, the, the male and effectively their, their sole purpose really is to, to, uh, to find a virgin queen um, uh, to mate with a, a queen bee, which happens on the wing, you know, uh, outside, well, out, you know, well away from the, the hive. So it doesn't happen within the hive. Um, and yeah, aside from that, they, they don't really have any other purpose. And so you only really find drone bees during um, or sort of late spring, summer, autumn months, where there might be virgin queens about, and other times of year that they're not they're not present within the hive, but they don't do you know they don't serve any other purpose really other than you know to find a virgin queen to mate with the queen in order to produce more more uh, um, more bees effectively because you obviously need you need um, the two parts of um, to come together to produce an egg. Um, I mean, there's, it's a lot more complicated than that in terms of, you know, their, their life cycle, but I won't go into too much detail in, in this presentation, but they've got real fascination, fascinating um, biology, which, which I do, uh, I do think I'd recommend uh, looking into in more detail. So in terms of just general 
a quick overview of the life cycle. Um, as I say, most of the, the eggs that are laid by the queen will develop into worker bees. Um, these start off as a little pinprick. And if I zoom in to, oops, I've gone to, uh, let's go back. No, I will Sorry about that. Yes. Uh, and so from, I'll just zoom, try and zoom in again. Here we go. That's better. So those are all um, tiny little structures. Those are freshly laid eggs. So those are, um, so the queen lays an egg in each cell, one egg. And then after a couple of days, it develops into a, a grub. And then the grub um, is fed certain um, food stuffs. And in this case, it's, uh, it's royal jelly. And then after a while, it's it's fed other 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 um, um, honey and things like that, which uh, which uh, which the worker bees feed to it. And then after a couple of weeks, um, after a couple of weeks, the grubs um, the cells are capped, and that's when the the bees undergo their metamorphosis. And then after after about twenty days or so, the adult bees emerge. So in terms of their life cycle, you know, approximately three weeks um, from egg through to um, emerging as an adult bee, and then probably another couple of um, an another sort of month or so of life. So these young bees, when they emerge, um, they'll they'll have certain duties within the hives, which will be um, feeding other grubs and bees, um, cleaning out the cells, processing honey, etc. And then generally speaking, um, and they'll produce wax as well, which is very important. And then as the, as they develop, then they'll, they'll, they'll be foraging bees. So they'll, they'll leave the hive and they'll, they'll go off every day on a, on a flight, uh, weather permitting to, to gather nectar and pollen. And I think, um, some statistic about, um, you know, it, it takes, I mean, it takes obviously thousands of bee flights in order to make, um, you know, even a teaspoon of full honey, but during, during a bee's bees lifestyle you know, lifetime it can it can produce you know quite a, quite a small quantity um so it's 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 quite kind of kind of amazing how how um um you know how, how active and how how uh, productive they can be within a relatively short lifetime i think the one thing i would stress is that this is you know average um obviously some bees will die early and and other bees will will last a little bit longer um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, that during the winter months, um, what will happen is that the queen will will stop laying, and effectively those bees which go into um, that sort of period of dormancy, not dormancy, but sort of less less activeness, uh, those bees then will will live all the way through the winter. So, the worker bees which you know stay with the queen during that period then may live for five months or, more or longer so you know it doesn't it doesn't always the rule doesn't always work in that sense now what's different about um queen bees uh, i mean a queen a queen bee is is not a the egg is the same so it's just an, a, the same worker egg but the the difference is that a queen bee um she's given more space so in this picture um the Thing which is hanging off the bottom of the frame is a capped queen cell, and you can see it's quite a large structure, almost like a like a peanut shape. Uh, and then there's another one actually to to the right of it, and some cells which have got um, potential queens to develop in them. So as the queen grub grows, you know these these get longer and longer. Um, and basically, the only difference with a queen and a worker bee is that the queen is fed a much higher percentage of raw jelly. And raw jelly is this, this substance which is secreted by the worker bees. And it's a very protein rich um, food. And it, and it by, it has, you know, certain, it triggers a certain internal response within the bees, which mean they're, you know, they're, they, they develop in a different way. So it's quite fascinating really how that, how that works. But, but effectively, you know, a queen, a queen bee is um, no different genetically from a worker bee. She's just been given a different, um, type of food, which has meant that her, she's developed in a different way. Um, and as I mentioned, then all of the worker bees, you know, they, they, you know, they don't mate or they don't produce offspring in the same way that the queen can. So what happens with, um, 
when this happens. So basically, um, in a, in, a, in a normal hive, you had just have one queen, one one queen, and then at a certain point, um, especially during the the late spring summer months, the bees will start to produce queen cells, um, and these queen cells then are a trigger for swarming. Now, swarming is a natural process. Um, it happens to most colonies, um, you know, every year, sometimes multiple times in a year. And basically it's a way of reproducing um, the bees. So if you imagine one colony on its own, it isn't going to be able to create more colonies without this swarming instinct. And part of what a beekeeper does is to try and manage that swarming because um, what happens during swarming is that the existing queen will leave with a percentage of the, the worker bees and she'll fly off um, and then they'll find an, a new location to set up and the whole process will start over again. And obviously, if you're a beekeeper, um, you know, there's a couple of aspects there. One, you're losing your, you know, your, your half your bees potentially. <laughs> um, two, you might be annoying the neighbors and creating a bit of a problem. Um, so, so part of what beekeeping is all about is trying to manage that swarming instinct. And there's certain things which trigger swarming. Um, when the, when the queen mates so she she goes she, so when a, a new queen emerges uh, say a virgin queen she flies off um she mates with uh, some drones some male bees she flies back to the hive and then she becomes the egg laying um uh, you know individual in the hive but then as time goes on she can live for several years her egg laying capability reduces and that's often an instinct for the worker bees to raise a new queen also if they don't have enough space then um it, within the hive there's there isn't enough available space for laying eggs it's often a trigger for swarming I mean, there are lots of different different reasons but i mean it is a natural instinct and, and does happen naturally so again it's something which bee, beekeepers have to manage and here's just some pictures of, of what happens during a swarming so the as i said the inside that but those balls of bees there'll be one queen and um, she gives off certain pheromones which obviously attract the other worker bees and they'll kind of huddle around her in a ball and all stay together and they'll stay like that potentially for up to a couple of days until they find somewhere suitable to, to set up um so we've probably all seen pictures of 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 this sort of thing and I think what's what's characteristic about swarms is, that generally speaking, I'm not not saying it's it's always the case, but they they tend to be quite um, placid. So, um, you know, contrary to what, you know, obviously it's quite can be quite intimidating having ten thousand bees in a in a ball and flying around your head, but often you know they're they're quite placid. They're they're full of um, honey which they've consumed, uh, ready to just to, to bring to their new new home. Uh, and they're really their focus is on trying to find you know a new place to live um and what people have done in in the past really is to to exploit this so they've uh, you know they've entered into competitions and things to, to to kind of put swarms on their bodies so, so basically they'll they'll put a queen around their neck and uh you know obviously attract all the bees or they'll do strange things but but generally speaking you know they they're they're quite placid and they don't tend to don't tend to sting or have a have much instinct to sting in, in this sort of when they're in this state not to say that all swarms are placid and i've certainly had some ones who are certainly more a bit more aggressive um swarming does happen uh good beekeeping is all about trying not to let your bees swarm but it does happen this is me up a ladder uh, in our street collecting a swarm from my bees which yeah unfortunately does happen um uh, this was a swarm. So in this case, it was at the top of a hawthorn tree, which is kind of awkward. So you can see I've gone up the tree and I've tried to uh, try to sort of get access to the bees so I can shake them into a box. So what I'm doing in this case is I'm collecting the bees which have swarmed um, to put them in a new hive. And you can't put, you know, those bees back in the original location because um, yeah, that just doesn't work for various reasons. So you have to then put them in a new hive and, and hopefully they'll stay um, succeed. And also, apart from gathering the bees, it also gathers quite a crowd when you see people are quite interested. But as I say, the bees are you know fairly relaxed in this sort of um, setting and they don't tend to be aggressive in any way. So once you've got your, your swarm, then you, you put that into a new a new hive, and this was one on the allotments years ago. 
So you can see I've sort of shook the branch, the bees have fallen into the box, and then I've sort of poured the bees into into the hive, and you can see them all sort of spreading out into the hive. And hopefully in most situations, that's it. You know, you can close the hive up and they'll stay there. You know, I've given them some some honey, so they've got some, some stores and some place to uh, start laying eggs, for the queen to start laying eggs. But sometimes it doesn't quite work, and uh, certainly had situations where I've collected a big bundle of bees and thought, great, here's it. And then the next day I've gone there and there's no bees. They've all gone back to where they were. <laughs> so in this situation, I, must, I mustn't I must have, um, you know, got the queen. Uh, and sure enough, when we were putting them back in the hive, th this is another technique. So instead of putting them in the box, you put them on a sheet in front of the hive and they kind of, you know, make their way in uh, to the hive, you know, by walking upwards. And sure enough, when we were looking at this picture, then we, we, we kind of looked closer and um, actually managed to uh, to see the queen. So the queen was certainly within that, that big bundle of bees. You can see in this case, she's she's not that much bigger than one of the worker bees, but she's got this sort of black, black abdomen. Okay. Um, so what, what does beekeeping involve? Well, certainly um, inspecting your bees. Um, you need to go in and open up the hive to check to see if there's any queen cells. That's very important, especially during the summer months, because if there are queen cells, it means that they're going to swarm. So you need to, to manage them to, to try to prevent that from happening. You don't want to be opening up your hive when it's very cold or it's wet. Um, you know, you're obviously going to annoy your bees. Um, things you need to be checking for when, when, you, when you're beekeeping is other eggs. If there are eggs, then you, you're pretty much guaranteed you, you've got a queen. Because remember, they're only eggs for a couple of days. Um, you know, are there larvae? Are there, are there these sealed, capped brood? And that's a good indication of what's going on in the hive. Um, uh, you know, bees only live for a number of weeks, and, you know, as adult bees. So, you know, the queen needs to be constantly laying eggs. Otherwise, the colony will quickly run out of, uh, out of bees. Um, you know, how many frames of brood are there? How many... Um, how big is the colony? Does it need more space? Um, are there drone cells? So the drones, um, slightly long, longer, larger cells. I haven't really dwelt on, on this aspect, but again, that's a good indication of um, drones are only produced during those those months where you have, um, you know, you have virgin queens around. Um, can you find a queen? Often with a big colony of bees, it's it's you know it's very difficult to find a queen. That's part of the reason why beekeepers mark the queen so they can identify her if they need to to take any action. Have the bees got enough honey? You know, if they're if we're going into a period of of worse weather, especially in the springtime, you know, the bees can quickly run out of honey and and you know face starvation. Um, in which case, the beekeeper might need to take action and and, and supplement. Um, uh, the food for his bees. Um, as I mentioned, you know, if the bees got enough space during the summer months when you've got periods of good weather, I mean, bees can bees can create a lot of honey. Uh, a large colony can create, you know, sort of 10 kilos of honey in, in, a, in a week or so. So you need to be, you know, constantly on, on this and, and be thinking about that. And generally speaking, during the, you know, the summer months, you should be tr opening up your hive at least, you know, once every nine days ideally or or you know once every two weeks if you if, you know otherwise and then there are other aspects which if, which um to think about and there are diseases which uh, affect bees um there's something called the varroa mite which lives on bees and it's certainly been quite a big uh, pest in the past not so much recently but it's something you need to kind of monitor and and take action if necessary and there are other diseases which um which affect bees um, which some of which you know you need you're, you're legally obliged to to, to uh, inform DEFRA if you have, but again those hopefully fingers crossed won't um, won't affect um, your bees if you decide to get some. Uh, just just to kind of show you, this is the varroa mite, so it's a little mite which um, gets into bees and it can cause uh, a lot of problems. It basically lives off the um, the blood supply of the, of the bee. Um, and you can see it's caused in this bottom right hand picture, it's caused uh, some wing deformities. So if you get an infestation of uh, varroa mites, it can have a big impact on, on a colony. And then there's the fun part. So uh, part of uh, beekeeping really is um, 
is the honey. And you can see in this bottom right hand picture, there's a, it's a frame of capped uh, honey. And ideally that's what your frames look like. You've got a pure, pure white. Uh, the white is the, the, the capping, the wax capping. And part of the process of extracting honey, um, or one of the types of extracting it really is to, you peel off this uh, layer of wax uh, with a sharp blade, sometimes a heated blade, and then you put it inside a centrifuge. So this uh, spinner on the top right hand picture, these, these are actually, uh, these frames don't have honey on them, but it's just for example, and you put them inside and then you, you spin it, you spin them uh, and then the honey is liquid. So it, it flies up to the side and collects in the bottom. And then you, um, you, you put a bucket underneath and you sieve it um, to, to extract the wax. Uh, so you're left with just the honey. And then obviously you jar that up. And this was part of last year's harvest. Sorry, last year was, wasn't a bad year for honey. And you can see there's, you know, there's a hundred or so jars of honey there. Um, from you know just a couple of colonies and that was that was only part of the uh, the harvest but, but yes i mean bees can be very productive they certainly when it's um they can produce um depending on the year you know you can you can have um 50 50 kilos of honey from potentially from one hive so you know they are very productive and they've, they've been bred obviously that way to um to, pr to produce lots of excess surplus honey um some of the other Things which bees produce, um, they collect pollen, which I mentioned is a food stuff. Now, some people do harvest this. Um, I personally don't, but it's, I think it's quite fascinating to, to look inside a hive and see all the different colors of the pollen that the bees have uh, collected. And each of those types of pollen uh, will relate to a different plant. And here's a little guide um, of, you know, the different colors of the, uh, the types of pollen. So it's not necessarily, um, you know the flower color has got nothing to do with the pollen color because obviously the pollen is a little tiny little tiny um, balls of genetic material which are contained within the male part of the flower so for example raspberries you know you, you know, they have this white pollen and um you know horse chestnut as it's quite quite dark color um i was looking at my bees the other day and they're all coming back it almost looked like they're covered in brick dust and it was probably plum or wild cherry so yeah really interesting but um again another aspect of of beekeeping is is seeing what they're up to and seeing them come back with their little leg baskets full of full of pollen and then some of the other things i'm just going to gloss over these really but uh propolis is uh something that the bees again collect from from plants they use it as, a, as like a glue almost and uh, some people collect <laughs> collect that from the bees, um, wax, a uh, very important bee product and royal jelly, which again is this, um, this product, which, uh, some people harvest from the bees. Again, I personally don't, but it's, um, it's, uh, you know, very protein rich, um, superfood, I think they call it, uh, just a quick example, or this is how I process my wax. Once I've got my, uh, wax, which I've extracted from, from honey production. Uh, put it in a dedicated saucepan because everything gets covered in wax, let me tell you, um, with some water. It's very important that you add water because otherwise, um, you know, it's flammable and you don't want it going on fire. And then after you boiled it up and sieved it, um, you can pour it into a container, something which you can get the, the wax out of afterwards. And what will happen is the, the, the stuff on the bottom is, is the water and other bits, and then you get the, the wax solidifying on top so you can then use this for uh, for any purposes uh, that you see fit or potentially some people make it into into new uh, frames of foundation for their bees so getting started in beekeeping um always good to um go on a course as i said i, I did you know two-day course but then I, I followed that up with some more practical course because you know there's a lot to learn in beekeeping and there are lots of um you know so the, the theory is always developing and emerging so it's, it's always worth keeping up good to have a mentor or somebody who you can turn to for advice. I've certainly borrowed on lots of people's experiences over the years. You can even do exams in beekeeping, you know, if you're interested. Um, obviously to get started, you'll need certain things like, a, the, the, you know, the boxes, the stand, uh, the roof and the frames. The frames are probably one of the most ex expensive parts because they're quite specific size and you need to buy those. Um, and then the kit, a bee suit, you know, something to protect you from getting stung, gloves, 
a smoker ready to smoke your bees just to uh, pacify them when you're going into the hive and then some sort of hive tool. And then generally speaking, most people will, will start off with, with a, a nucleus or a swarm uh, around this time of year in the summer. Uh, and then they'll build their bees up uh, by doing artificial swarms or by dividing the, the hives as, as they go. Um, worth joining the British Beekeepers Association um, for, for, for several reasons. One, um, you get notifications from uh, Bee Base um, telling you about sort of potential issues or, you know, reports of disease, etc. It also provides you with some form of insurance, so public liability, but also if your bees uh, fail or they get disease for some reason, then they'll actually pay for the, the cost of replacing them. And it doesn't cost much to, uh, to, to be a member. Uh, well worth joining your local beekeeping association. They might have equipment you can borrow, such as extractors. Um, I'm a member of our Manchester and District Beekeeping Association. They're based in Heaton Park. Um, they run lots and lots of training. Um, you can you used to be able to, buy, to borrow extractors, you know, hun uh, for extracting honey from them. I'm not sure if you still can, but I know they sell equipment and things like that. And they also run lots of, um, you know, information sessions. Um, having someone you could beekeep with is certainly worthwhile, it, it, you know, especially if, you know, uh, during the summer months where you might need to go on holiday, you need somebody to open up the hive to check, avoid this, this, this swarming and time. Beekeeping can be quite time consuming, especially during the very active times of the year. Uh, you need to be, you know, need to have enough equipment ready that if, if the bees swarm, you can put them into a new box. Um, it takes quite a lot of time, for example, um, extracting honey. So you need, to, you need a certain amount of time to do it. Um, so in summary, here's a, just a quick summary of uh, what we've covered. As I Here's some um, links for further info. Um, I won't sort of go over these, but I think well worth, um, if you are interested in beekeeping, um, Bridge Beekeeping Association or your, joining your, your local uh, beekeeping society would be well worthwhile. Uh, and there are various groups uh, involved in beekeeping you might be able to get along, get involved with and, and um, uh, through that way then uh, learn more about beekeeping. Okay, uh, now pass over to Emily for any questions. Great, thanks Paul, that was very, very thorough, very good. Uh, I think loads and loads of questions. Um, one of the first questions, uh, Bart asked about different races of bees. So I suppose it means kind of subspecies of bees, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, different strains and how you can tell one from another. Right. Um, good question. I, <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to answer that question. I, I know I'm, I'm vaguely aware that, you know, our, most of our commercial bees are, have come from this, this European honeybee. Apis mellifera, which um, you know is native, a native insect to to most of Europe and um, well other parts of the world as well. And from that, then I guess individuals have, have bred, you know, the the commercial honeybee that we know. You certainly do get, uh, with even within the honeybees that I have, you, you you get different characteristics. Some are more sort of black rather than that sort of stripy. Uh, the queens can vary quite a lot in colour and, 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 and makeup. Claudia asks if bee hotels are actually any good. Yes. I think generally people recommend, you know, go, go larger on them. Uh, they, they're not, as I mentioned, they're not specifically designed for honeybees or for bumblebees. Uh, although but not to say the bumblebees might not set up home in, in a larger one. Mm -hmm. Um, Personally, I, you know, I see a lot of these mason bees and I, and, and I think they really, they really like sort of cavities and in, in uh, like that really sunny hot wall. And I see them sort of burrowing through the, the old mortar and, and creating a little space in it. Uh, I think if you're going to, if you're going to get one, you know, make sure it's in the right location. And um, um, I, I do recommend, you know, go big because then obviously it's maximizing the opportunity. But at the end of the day, it's still, you know, it's creating space for something, whether it's spiders or lace wings, you know, it's, it's all, it's all habitat at the end of the day, isn't it? So. Daffer, who sees that he's in Oldham, he was talking about having watched lots of YouTube videos and been part of lots of online groups and things. And he wants, he feels confident enough to start, he, um, to set up his own hive now. Um, uh, I meant, and he was so he was asking where he can buy some bees. I mentioned that 
you'd be likely to suggest that he got in touch with local groups mm-hmm. uh, and that would be the best way to find out. Yeah, join join your local beekeeping association and, uh, you know, if you're in Oldham, then that's not far from um, Manchester Beekeepers, which are in Heaton Park, um, uh, yeah. in sort of Presswich area. So well worth getting in touch with them and they will certainly have members who, who can provide or sell you uh, a, a, a nucleus or a swarm. And uh, that's generally the way that most people will get started. Um, well worth doing it that way rather than just buying off some random individual because, you know, potentially, how, how do you know you've got a decent queen? And Vicky was asking about, uh, she says, when the young bees hatch, do they reuse the cell or is it dormant? Oh, yeah. 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 So I should have said that really, but yes, the, the cells are used over and over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And what you tend to find over time is that the, the wax becomes darker and darker. Um, and that's because of um, uh, things which are left behind by, by the bees when they emerge. And interestingly, the, you know, the size of the cell for a worker bee and for storing honey or for pollen is, is all the same. So they can be used for multiple different uses. Uh, what you tend to find is that if your queen makes her way into the box where you have your honey, then you end up with a mixture of brood and honey. But then if you find her and put her back in, in a box where she's meant to be within the brood chamber, then, you know, the bees will then fill up those cells with, with honey again. And what I didn't mention is that the, the way the beekeepers manage that is they have what's called a, uh, it's like a mesh um, a queen excluder which prevents the queen from getting up into the top of the hive where the honey is. And because she's slightly long, larger, fatter, or wider, I should say, um, she can't get through the, the bars on the, uh, the queen excluder, but the worker bees can. So that's how you kind of keep them separate. Sarah was asking about, she says she keeps seeing these online ads about flow hives. Mm. They have wooden frames, but the honeycomb is plastic. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> Apparently it's better, it's more f- for the bees. It's more kind of friendly to the bees and less messy, causes yeah. less stress. Uh. So she wondered if this was just a gimmick or a viable advancement in beekeeping. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen videos, watch videos, it seems fascinating. And obviously somebody's you know spent a lot, quite a lot of time thinking about it and doing it. I, I, I think there were certain aspects which I would be skeptical of until I knew more about it and I tried it for myself. Um, yeah, certainly if you don't open up your hive, you know, you don't, you don't stress your bees, but then if you don't open the hive, you've got no way of managing them. And part of beekeeping is to, to open it up and, and check what's happening. I mean, for example, I was beekeeping yesterday and one of my colonies for one reason or another doesn't have a queen. So they're trying to raise a new queen. Um, so I'm now trying to help them in that process by providing eggs which then they can rear into a new um a new queen and left to their own devices you know they might they might just work it out or uh, sometimes a, a new queen might 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 sort of fly in it does it does happen but um i guess if you know if you don't open up your hive as much then you, you can't really manage that swarming instinct as well which is is kind of a key part of beekeeping um so so yes i can i can see why um, it might be good to do that, but, but generally speaking with the honey anyway, you know, you tend to have it just in, in boxes at the top of the hive. You don't have to manipulate them as such. You don't have to open up each frame and check each frame. You just, at the end of the year, you say, well, there you go. That's you for the winter. And this is, this is stuff I'm going to extract. And then you extract the honey from those frames. Um, yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I'm yet to be convinced, but I can see it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. I think, um, no, nevertheless, with any type of beekeeping, you know, you, you need to go into it knowing that, you know, potentially it's something you need to spend quite a bit of time on. And, um, I guess if it's, it's, it's one way of, of, you know, reducing that amount of time, then, you know, it might be a, a good innovation. Hmm. On a kind of similar, um, theme, Nico was talking about, um, just keeping bees but not extracting honey Mm. and causing distress to the animals he he says he loves bees and wants to support the bee populations but 
don't personally find extracting honey ethical? Mm. Is it worth stewarding a hive to support them or better off spending energies on increasing availability of their flowers? Well, it's an interesting debate and I can see where you're coming from. I think at the end of the day, um, even though it's a native insect, it's, um, you know, it's been bred by humans for thousands of years. So it, it's, it's in some way, it's like keeping livestock or it's similar to, you know, our, our cattle that have been bred obviously from, from, from native, um, animals, but are no longer, you know, a, a, a native, um, no longer, you know, a natural animal in the wild. I, I think with bees, it's maybe slightly different because, you know, they will go off and create a colony somewhere and, and, um, do their own thing. And you do, you, you do supposedly get, um, there are remnants of, of native bee populations, but, um, I mean, there are different, lots and lots of different aspects to this debate. Um, if you wanted to support local bee population, then maybe, uh, bumblebees might be a better mm. thing to focus in on and pr providing space for them to, to rear, um, they're young, you know, might, might be a worthwhile endeavor. The problem with having just a colony of bees, honeybees in your garden or something like that is that if you don't manage them, then you end up with swarming and then you'll end up with bees where you don't want bees, um, such as people's lofts and things like that. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, just be wary of, of maybe, of maybe just in, embarking on, um, you know, keeping bees solely for, for keeping bees. You certainly can, but I, I guess it's just how you manage that because I guess one of the aspects of bees is that they've been bred to be very productive and, and producing a lot of excess of honey and, and to live in much, much larger, larger and larger colonies. And then, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? Um, Another kind of question we have uh, from Nat, she says she, she's yeah. uh, recently moved to the Outer Hebrides mm -hmm. and she wants to start beekeeping, but there's really high winds there. She mentioned that sometimes so, uh, that they've got um, predictions of 70 mile per hour um, winds. Uh, so she can hardly stand up uh, in, in those winds. So how are bees going to cope in that situation? Is there any way to do that? Are there any types of bees or hives that are good in that kind of location? I have no idea, to be honest. I, <laughs> yeah. I think you're going to struggle. I think uh, certainly bees do really well in urban areas, as I mentioned, because of all the, the abundance of flowers. So if, if you're someone like the Outer Hebrides, I mean, are there enough flowering plants um, available. I mean, bees will, you know, choose their days if it is particularly cool or when, or, you know, they, you might have a much shorter season, but I, I don't see why not. I mean, you get, um, as long as you're not on the very top of a hill, um, you know, if you're fairly low down, then, you know, there's bound to be some good days in, in, in amongst, in amongst those. Um, I think the best thing really is to contact local beekeepers and find out what they do mm. if there are any yeah great um so just kind of moving forward from there i think you've answered a, f a few questions uh sort of inadvertently um uh italia said would it be okay to go very small and keep just one colony um in one hive are there any advantage uh, disadvantages in doing this um yeah, generally speaking, what happens is if, if you have one colony, then at the end of the year, you'll have two or more because the natural instinct is to swarm. And if you don't, don't then have somebody to give them those bees to, um, you end up with two. So they always say, well, if you have for every colony you have, you should have enough equipment to have, um, you know, double that. So if, if I'm starting the year with two, uh, hives, you know, I've got enough equipment to just in case for four hives, but potentially I could have more than that if the bees swarm multiple times. Um, yeah, I think the more colonies you have, the more time it'll take, but it's obviously, um, it's obviously more efficient as well, um, because you're probably, um, you know, it, it gets to a certain point where obviously you need some help as well. So I think to answer the question, um, yes, yeah, start off small. But just be wary that, you know, you might need additional equipment because you cannot put a swarm back in its original box. Um, 
because the bees will just literally kill each other. Um, so it's so always worth just um, one of the, I guess, just to mention that one of the disadvantages is if if you only have one colony and for some reason or other, you know, you end up in a situation where, say, you lose your queen, say she dies or something like that, then you've got no means of getting a new queen unless you, you know, get one from someone else. So in the example I talked about earlier where I was going through the, the two hives and one hive is queenless, um, I was able to take some frames of eggs from from the other hive to give to that hive and they can hopefully raise a, a queen from from those eggs. So I'd say two is optimal, but um, you know, bear in mind that if you start out with two, then you might end up with four at the end of the year. <laughs> right. I think that's probably, we've, we've kind of run to 20 past, so um, <laughs> a few have left, but um, most, most have stayed actually. Uh, was, I mean, there's so much to talk about, isn't there? And um, hopefully some of those follow-up links will be helpful to people and uh, there's not, I think we've covered most of the questions, but I'll go back through the chat um, afterwards and I'll take all people's um, comments and suggestions and things and round them up in an email. Um, loads of people giving lots of advice, actually, which is really great um, sharing, sharing ideas and information. So if do you have anything, uh, any kind of anything else to add, Paul? Um, no, no. Thanks for listening. Um, yeah. And if you do. Um, or you are involved in beekeeping or, you, you know, you do want to get involved, uh, you know, I think it's certainly a well worth and fascinating um, pastime. But yeah, great. that's all. Thanks. Thank you. That was brilliant. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. And I will send through all this information afterwards. Um, our webinar next week is on setting up a market garden with Platfields um, Market Garden in South Manchester. So please sign up to that if you're interested. And uh, yeah, have a lovely weekend. Cheers, Paul. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.